bit, I'm going to show images of hepatic encephalopathy. The imaging findings are quite different in acute and chronic hepatic encephalopathy, so I will discuss them separately. We all know that the liver detoxifies our blood, and in liver failure, there's accumulation of toxins, which is not good for the brain. The imaging findings in acute hepatic encephalopathy are mainly located in the cortex on T2 flare and diffusion weighted images. In this patient with clinical and laboratory signs of liver failure with high ammonium, you can see cortical hyperintensity with restricted diffusion in the cingulate and insular region and usually the central and occipital region are spared in acute hepatic encephalopathy. The increased ammonium is important in the pathogenesis of this hepatic encephalopathy and if the ammonium is not increased you should reconsider your diagnosis. This high ammonium causes the astrocytes and neurons to take up lesser glutamate. The ammonium is converted by an astrocyte specific enzyme called glutamine synthase in glutamine. And glutamine increases the intracellular pressure in the astrocyte and leads to mitochondrial dysfunction. Microscopically, this gives Alzheimer type 2 astrocytes, which have nothing to do with Alzheimer's disease, but were also described by alloyed Alzheimer. And they reflect the cytotoxic edema in the astrocytes, which also explains the imaging findings. The cells have a large nucleus and little cytoplasm. The glutamine in the astrocytes also induces the neurons to synthesize more GABA, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So this leads to a decreased neuronal metabolism, explaining part of the neuropsychiatric and cognitive symptoms. And there's microglial activation. The ammonium is increased in the entire brain, but there's selective vulnerability of certain areas. And the cingulate and insular involvement resembles the involvement in limbic encephalitis a little bit, but in hepatic encephalopathy, the hippocampus and amygdala are spared. The abnormalities also occur in the white matter, usually not visible but detectable on spectroscopy, with increase in glutamine and glutamate and a decrease in choline in this patient with liver cirrhosis and the spectroscopy normalized after liver transplantation. In chronic hepatic encephalopathy there's accumulation of manganese in the globus pallidus and substantia nigra leading to Parkinsonism. We know it is manganese in the basal ganglia because there was a very, very nice study in the Lancet from a German group in 1995, where they looked at 10 patients with severe liver cirrhosis that were on the list for transplantation. And they did laboratory neuropsychiatric tests and MRI. And three of the patients died before receiving the transplantation. And they also did an MRI post-mortem. And you can see on the post-mortem MRI that there's not only increased T1 signal in the pallidum, but also in the putamen and in the caudate. And they correlated it to the findings on microscopy. So they found out it was caused by the manganese. If patients get a liver transplant or if the liver failure um, is solved in another way. The
patient first improves clinically and after a few months the MR also normalizes. So this high T1 signal would disappear. In the differential diagnosis of chronic hepatic encephalopathy with a high signal in the basal ganglia is Wilson's disease with copper accumulation, hyperalimentation or parenteral nutrition where patients also have accumulation of manganese. There can be iron accumulation in a group of diseases called neurodegeneration with brain iron accumulation and we'll come back to that in the future. You can think of hemorrhage, for example, in necrotizing encephalitis or Japanese encephalitis. And there's also high T1 signal in fasces that calcify in neurofibromatosis. And we're going to look at fasci 